my first experience with ESRF, I was a master student. It was 1992, I think. And I visited the site, and there was a big hole. And uh, so I saw the construction of it. And then uh, when I started make my career in Grenoble in 2000, I started to do rock physics experiments. And then for some years, uh, uh, I didn't do many experiments at ESRF. I was doing something else. And uh, five or six years ago, I came back. And I will show you what, uh, what we can be done using synchrotron to unravel earthquakes. And I have taken the example of the earthquake in Turkey because first it's recent, so it's still in your mind. And uh, I would like also to thank at the beginning uh, Michel Bouchon with a colleague in Grenoble because I will show some results on these earthquakes that uh, he's working on. But let's start with uh, 1947, a famous professor in uh, geophysics called Benno Gutenberg. Benno Gutenberg is, uh, was a seismologist at Caltech. He is one of the founders of the Gutenberg Richter scale of earthquake magnitude. And that's a letter he wrote to uh, someone from Los Angeles, writing him a letter about earthquake prediction. So the answer was quite to the point to this Herman Taylor. Dear sir, this laboratory does not predict earthquakes. Specific predictions giving time and place come from amateurs, publicity seekers, believers of the occult, or just plain fool. Los Angeles remain exposed to the risk of a grand earthquake, which may take place any time. So that was 1947, and more or less we could write this these days again. But there is something that has changed in 1947, is this. The way we look at the Earth, the planet Earth, is very different. In uh, 1947, there was mainly seismometers, few boreholes, and a hammer for the geologist. And what happened now in the past 50 years is an accumulation of data taken from seismometers, fleets of seismometers, from satellites, from drones. And we have seen that at uh, the bottom, I've put synchrotron and large facilities because this. Marie, est-ce que tu peux renvoyer encore le mail du séminaire? Je trouve qu'il n'y a pas grand monde en bas. Si tu peux mettre now à la place de today. We speaking. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Do you have some comments on my presentation? Or it's, no, it's fine. Hello. Okay. So, um, so what has changed is all this data. And the way we do experiments, as a geologist, we were going on the field doing lab experiments. Now we use Sacrotron, and it, has, it, has, it is a game changer. So earthquakes. As uh, many of you know, I think all of you in this room probably, earthquakes, they don't occur randomly on Earth. They occur mainly at plain boundaries. And the depth of the earthquake varies between uh, almost the surface to a few hundred kilometers. But the most damaging ones are between, they start at between uh, 10 to 30 kilometer depth. That's this one which are really damaging. They go along convergent plates. They go also along along subduction zone, so when the plate is going below another one. The earthquake also, oh, sorry, it was a bit too fast. I'm already at the end. So they have been recorded now for one, more than 100 years. And this picture on the right, shows as a function of time from 1900 to now, the number of earthquakes recorded every year, depending on their magnitude. So on the top panel, the blue ones are the magnitude larger than 7.5. Then the yellow one, the blue one larger than 6.25 and so on. As you see in 100 years, the number of uh, yellow and blue one didn't change much. It just means that we recorded all of them. But the red and the black one, the number is increasing with time, and particularly since uh, after the Second World War, with the installation of seismometers everywhere on Earth. Now we record all the earthquakes above magnitude 5.5 uh, on the planet. And the lower panel on the right is, uh, is the same data, it's just the density of points we have every year. If we average the seismicity on Earth over one year, it's equivalent to one single magnitude nine. So you see that some years, for example, then where there is a, an earthquake, larger than magnitude nine, it means that that year, 
the overall budget earthquake of the Earth was larger. So we measure earthquake with a magnitude. It's a scale in the horizontal axis, uh, which is uh, uh, where the magnitude is, is coded into a number which does not have any limit. There is no lower magnitude or higher magnitude. It's a log scale. Between each digit, there is an increase of a factor of 32 of energy. So it's a 32 log scale. And on the vertical axis, that's the equivalent in joules of an earthquake. So I put that also some, uh, it's, a, in a, it's a linear scale in a log, uh, log linear scale. And uh, if you start with a lightning bolt, lightning bolt, so the equivalent of magnitude three earthquake. The Turkey earthquake, it's a magnitude 7.8. It was two earthquakes, but the equivalent magnitude of the two was 7.8. And I put some comparison, for example, the US annual energy consumption, the equivalent of magnitude 10. So US consume in energy more than all the seismicity on Earth. And another one, which you can also, uh, it's an Earth daily receipt of solar energy, orders of magnitude larger. Earthquake cause human casualties. So that's all the earthquake with human casualties since 2000, so the last 23 years. And perhaps you can see that below magnitude six, the number of casualties remains small in average. And above magnitude six, we start to have a spread of casualties. It just means that some magnitude 6.5 earthquake, when they occur very close to a city, the casualty number of casualty will uh, could be high. And when they close, they occur either close to a city that has been built to resist earthquake or far from any city. The number of casualties is low. The earthquake in Turkey, the total number of casualties was around 60,000. And that's one of the most deadly earthquake uh, in the, since the beginning of this century. So what is an earthquake? An earthquake, it's, uh, it's a shaking of the ground. And the conceptual model we have of earthquake is quite simple. Two blocks corresponding to two tectonic plates are loaded by the tectonic displacement. They accumulate a bit like a spring. They accumulate elastic energy. And during this earthquake, the elastic energy is released. The earthquake propagates usually at the velocity of the elastic waves of the sea, of the rocks, several kilometers per second. The two plates move. For the case of Turkey, the displacement, lateral displacement was up to eight meters. And after the earthquake, there is what is called the post-seismic. It's, it's a relaxation, so they are aftershock. So secondary earthquakes after the main one. And that's uh, what we teach to students is that two blocks, an interface, and earthquake or the interface. If we look now to nature, the reality is a bit more complex. That's the piece of California, where the black lines correspond to the faults. So that's the equivalent of the interface here. And all the points coded by color, which is coding the depths, correspond to small earthquakes. And what we start to see that in this area, the earthquakes are not located only on the faults. They also occur in the volume around the fault. And that's how the, the view on earthquake is changing in the past decade, is that instead of having a, a 2D process, two-dimensional process along an interface, probably the preparation of the earthquake involves some deformation in the volume and tiny earthquake there before the big earthquake arrives. Let's take an example of an earthquake that occurred in 2015 in, uh, in Nepal, in India, Nepal, near Kathmandu. So now with the seismometers possible to invert the displacement at depth. So the earthquake occur along an interface here between two plates, let's call it India on the left and Eurasia on the right. That's this white box is the, the equivalent of this plane. The little dots, that's the position of the earthquake as a function of time. And the time is increasing. So the entire earthquake lasted for 60 seconds, a bit more than a minute. And the color is the slip rate. So at which velocity the interface is slipping. 
And what we see here for this earthquake, for example, the earthquake stayed at depths between uh, 15 and five kilometer depths. It didn't reach the surface. The shaking reached the surface. And this earthquake was famous because the Mount Everest went down by one meter because of this earthquake. And if we just represent in one dimension what occurred along the earthquake propagation, we get the movie at the bottom. I hope I can play it. The movie at the bottom where a pulse of energy is propagating along this interface. And sometimes it will slow down when reaching what is called the, the barrier. And sometimes it will stop at the end uh, in the same way as the earthquake in uh, Nepal has stopped. So let's come back now to Europe. We have a seismic hazard of Europe. A seismic hazard map, where what we see is that the, the plate boundary between you, uh, Africa and then uh, Arabia and North Anatolia and Europe is very active. So the warm color, it corresponds to a high seismic hazard. In Grenoble, we have a bit of seismic hazard, not too much, but still, uh, it's still there. I'm living in uh, Norway, very modest there. It's very safe to do earthquake research there. And let's concentrate now on Turkey, where you see these two purple lines, which correspond to the most hazardous regions in Turkey. Turkey has seen uh, two big earthquakes in 1999. It was called the Izmit and Duce earthquake, with more than 20,000 casualties. It was on the north uh, limit, North Anatolian fault, on this plate limit. And the one in February occurred on this plate limit. So Turkey is uh, correspond to this Anatolian plate, which is extruded to the west by the displacement of the Arabian plate and the African plate against the Eurasian. And two main plate boundaries, the North Anatolian fault and the East Anatolian fault, uh, are loaded at a rate of centimeter per year. So 1999, the Izmit and Duce earthquake, and 2023, the two earthquakes here. Uh, in uh, southeast Turkey. So now with drones, you can fly just above under, after an earthquake and get very nice or very precise picture. That's a field in Turkey. Uh, the tracks are tracks from uh, agriculture exploitation. And I think you can recognize that there is an offset of more than six meters. If we do a detailed map, this offset is not a straight line. It's uh, the damage zone, which contain a lot of fractures, and these fractures uh, have been sliding during the earthquake. That's another view of the damage of, uh, of this earthquake, where the fault is here, and you can see that the rail tracks have been offset by, uh, by the displacement of the earthquake. So the Anatolian plate, let's zoom now in this area. What happened in February is that two earthquakes broke these two faults. So the red one here and the blue one there. The first paper arrived three months after the earthquake. It was paper in uh, journals where we call that diamond journals. The journal where you submit, there is a review process and everything is made by a researcher for researchers. So this one is called, for example, Seismica. And they were able to make it uh, very fast, uh, almost two months after the earthquake. What is possible to see in this area also is the previous earthquakes. So the one in February, that's the green one. And this one, red, blue, and purple, that's the earthquake since 2010. So we start to see a scenario where the northern plant has broken. And then what happened in February that the earthquake continued to break the southern part of the plate boundary. And there are also some earthquake, historical earthquakes, starting from 1100 that were recorded in this area. So this area, we know it's very active. Because we have satellites and drones, 
what is possible to do is to fly and take picture before the earthquake, picture after the earthquake, and use a technique which is called digital image correlation that you do, some of you, in your experiment. You correlate to image and you try to, to find the displacement field. And that can be done with a drone image or satellites or, or a plane image. And that's the view of what happened for these two earthquakes. So the red to blue color is the east-west displacement. So for example, if we take the second earthquake, this one, the yellow star, that's the hypocenter where it started, and then it spread laterally along the fault. And it means that this part here move with respect to this one with a displacement of something like eight meters. And the displacement is vanishing away from the fault just because it's very localized on the interface and then it's an elastic, uh, an elastic uh, displacement that can fit this effect. The 7.8, it has also shown this kind of displacement. So what did happen? What happens is that this two faults broke. And because we have splits of seismometers in this area, all the data, they arrived more or less immediately during and after the earthquake. So they were available. That allowed to identify which fault has broken. And I don't know if you see all the little dots. It's small earthquakes that occur after the main shock. It's called aftershock. And that's the relaxation of the main fault. So the first one occurred here. The second one, a few hours later, and a few weeks later, this part of the plate boundary broke. It was a magnitude 6.3 earthquake. So if we now count all this relaxation of earthquakes, the two main shocks are here, February 6, a doublet of earthquake, magnitude 7.6 and 7.8. And then with time, the number of earthquake and the magnitude is decreasing. And that follows a relaxation in one over time, which is called an Omori law. Omori was a seismologist who invented this, uh, this law. And uh, a few, days, few weeks later, two weeks later, the magnitude 6.4 earthquake also with this aftershock. Two weeks after the earthquake, I got a, a, an email from a research gate. I don't know if you. Do you know ResearchGate? It's a repository where you can put your articles. And some years ago, I have a PhD student working in Grenoble, Gokan Aslan, work a paper called Analysis of Secular Ground Motion in Istanbul from Long-Term Inside Time Series. And I got an email from ResearchGate saying that more or less the paper was not read. It was a very few read per day to several thousand read people reading this paper uh, per day or per week, and that's the earthquake. That's the effect, and I fit these uh, four points, and these four points, they follow a relaxation in one over time. So earthquake relax energy in one over time, and uh, probably social media communication relax uh, with this kind of uh, effect. So there have been previous earthquake in this area. So let's zoom. So we are here at the plate boundary. The two earthquakes from last February, and that's the historical earthquakes. So they broke the plate boundary over time. But what has changed is that you see that this time the entire plate broke in once. That's what created the 7.8. In previous time, this plate boundary broke in segment. And when it break in segment, each segment creates a smaller earthquake. And that was the big difference of uh, what happened in February compared to what happened in the historical time is that instead of creating several smaller earthquakes, it created a big one. So now with uh, all the seismometers and uh, also this uh, GNSS or GPS that record the ground displacement at a frequency of one point per second, the seismometer that record at 50 to 100 points per second, it's possible to invert the displacement at depths during the earthquake. So seismologists have developed tools to do that. And I will show you a movie of this plate boundary here. So the fault here is there. The fault is supposed to be vertical at depth. 
to up to 20 kilometer depth. The color you will see is the slip on the fault. And you will see this movie here, the red part is as a function of time, how much energy is released. So the slip starts and then release energy. And then there is the second earthquake that occurred a few hours later. So let's start with the first one. The earthquake starts on the secondary fault here, then propagates on the main fault and stop at the extremity. If I play it again, it starts here at a velocity of 3.3 kilometers per second and propagate there. And that's the liberation of energy. So let's look at the two earthquakes as a time series. So that's the biggest one, 7.8. That's the second after a few hours later. So the first one started on a small fault that reached the plate boundary, propagated bilaterally, and then stopped after a bit less than a minute. And the second one stopped after 30 seconds. So could we have predicted this earthquake? So the answer is no. And what usually seismologists do is that after the earthquake, we come back to the data the weeks or days or months before and try to see what has happened. So my colleague, Michel Bouchon, gave me this, uh, started this study. So that's time since uh, so almost 2,000 days before the earthquake, and the earthquake occurred at time zero. And that's the number of earthquakes accumulated in a circle of 200 kilometers around the epicenter. So we see a curve, which is part is a linear increase. It's just that the fact that there is a constant earthquake rate in this area. Sometimes there are increases like that, and each increase corresponds to an earthquake plus its aftershock sequence, then the steady increase, and so on. And we start to see some increase here. Can you see it? So let's do the exercise now. Instead of taking 200 kilometers, let's take 100 kilometers. Since 1800 days before the earthquake. And now there is clearly an increase. So what's the next step? Let's go 50 kilometers. So a circle of 50 kilometers. And then there is a clear increase. If we look at this increase, so here that's the fault that broke and that propagated to the main one. That's the epicenter of the February earthquake. What happens in months before the earthquake is these two clusters, one here, one there. So before 112 July last year, there was some small earthquake, that's the black dots, spread a bit randomly. Then that's what happened. These two clusters, they open, they happen since last July. And we can even separate them in time. So there is a first series in uh, July, September, October, November last year, December, January, and the main earthquake was here. So one question will be, uh, do these small earthquakes, which occur at some distance, less than 50 kilometers, did they control the nucleation or the start of the big earthquake? One problem with earthquakes is that they start at 10 kilometer depths. We don't have data directly from there. So either we record them from the surface at several kilometers where they start, or we try to reproduce the condition of earthquake at depths, and that's where the synchrotron uh, is coming in play. So let's start with the earthquake. An earthquake, that's my view. First, there is a zone at depth, 10, 15 kilometer depth, where some deformation will occur slowly before the earthquake. This deformation will accumulate and then the earthquake will start. So this preparation process, we call that the nucleation framework, is everything that happened before the earthquake and that will control its initiation. Then the earthquake propagates. That's the movie I have shown you. The rupture propagates at kilometer per second. So that's step two. We call that a dynamic rupture. So there is a tip of an earthquake that propagates at kilometer per second. And behind, that's the black zone. That's the fault that starts to slip. 
So when it sleep, we call that a friction. It's an interface on which there is sleep, and it's a frictional process. And what we do at TSRF is that we study these three steps, one, two, three. So this step, we have started to do that, and we will continue on BM18. What happens at this uh, small pink point here, dynamic rupture? So the shock wave that crosses a rock and starts to shatter it, we do that on 1919. And what happened during sleep and after sleep, when some stress or some strain is recorded in the rock, so the rock has recorded the passage of the earthquake, we will study that on ID 11. And everything in done in this project that started a year ago. So this project does not come from, uh, from nowhere. It started in 2015, in fact, where we built an apparatus, which was called Hades, which was installed on ID 19. And this apparatus allowed to take a small rock sample. Here it's one centimeter height for times five millimeter diameter to deform it until it breaks and to record images in 3D so to do time-lapse imaging of a rock during deformation. So for uh, the first five years, we, uh, we deformed all kinds of rocks. We had colleagues coming from uh, many universities worldwide. Uh, we trained uh, five or six PhDs and postdocs, and we published around uh, 35 publications based on this machine. And this machine initiated the project break, which started a year ago. And I will uh, give you a bit of details. So we will, do, we will try to reproduce the three steps of the earthquake, the nucleation, the fast damage during rupture propagation, and the sleep behind. We do that on three beam lines, ID19, ID11, and BM18. The way we work is that we have a team of early career researchers and experienced people. So some of you, I see many of you know Benoit. Uh, yeah, he's in the back. Uh, Sadish and Erina are here today because we have some beam time and we do five days of experiment. And uh, that's me. Uh, Jess should have come, but she's expecting a baby next week. So she couldn't come. And Fabian. And Jean-Baptiste uh, contributed to the experiments. And he, I don't know if he has arrived, but he will come this evening to help for the experiment. So we will be this uh, machine called Zeus, which will be installed on BM18. And Zeus, it will be the first machine where we can really reproduce the condition at 10 kilometer depth. With Hades, we were at two, three kilometer depths. With Zeus, we can go deeper. And what we will do also, we will be able to put small microphones on the rock. So listen to the rock while it deforms. So the apparatus has arrived. Uh, BM18 is almost ready, so I hope that uh, perhaps at the beginning of next year we can, uh, we can do the first scans. And what we expect to find is... Uh, can I play the music? Yeah. What we can expect to find is looking at rocks, like this one. So that's a, a small piece of granite. Deform it and look at how damage or small micro fractures will grow in the rock as long when we start to compress the rock and deform it. So the idea is to reproduce what occurs at depth before an earthquake where some damage will accumulate in a rock volume. And this damage, that's the the blue microfractures. So the size here is a four millimeter diameter and one centimeter height. This damage will accumulate until many fractures will start to span the entire system. And when many fractures span the system, the system will collapse and that's the smaller earthquakes in the laboratory. So we will reproduce this uh, smaller earthquake, but with uh, this, we will be also able to listen to the micro cracks uh, to do a bit like a seismologist. They have seismometer to listen that depth. Here we will listen in the sound. So why it's important to do that is because even the concepts of what happens at depth, the physical concepts, they are still debated in uh, the earthquake community. We don't know exactly what happens. 
So some years ago, for example, we used Hades to show that before breaking a rock, there is a competition between uh, damage and some damage, they rotate in one direction, some they rotate in the other direction. And these two, they rotate in the sample until one direction will be selected and the final direction of rotation will select the final fracture. Another set of experiments we will do is really to see what happens at the tip of the earthquake where a shock wave, an elastic shock wave propagate in the rock and start to damage it. So for this, there is a, a, a split Hopkinson pressure bar apparatus uh, developed at, uh, on Beamline ID19 in collaboration with Hamitai Cohen from Israel. The physical process is quite simple. It's a little cylinder of rock one centimeter long between two bars. So that's a sketch of the, of the system. That's a rock, that's a bar. And the striker or an impactor inside on, on this bar. An elastic wave propagate on the bar, damage the sample and propagate to the next bar. So let's see if I can show it. So that's the bar, the sample is in the middle here. An elastic wave propagate, then reach the sample, damage it, create fracture. And then the idea is to try to image, so that's a numerical simulation. The idea is try to, uh, to image this on real rocks. Mm. And we have started last year. That was one of the first experiments with the, the European project. So that's the kind of data we get. It's a very high speed, very ultra fast imaging of a rock sample. So the shock comes from the top to the bottom. And from this image and from sensor installed on the bar, we can recover the strain as a function of time. So how much the sample is shortening. The stress, so what was the force applied on the sample. And the strain rate is how fast the sample deformed. And uh, that was a piece of granite that was completely shattered. And that's probably what happens at the tip of an earthquake. The earthquake propagate and shatter the rock. And this process is very important because behind the tip of the earthquake, the two plates start to slip. And when they slip, they will slip on the material that has been completely damaged, the material which will be like a powder. So the friction or the resistance to slip will be controlled by how much of the damage has been produced by this. Uh, by the earthquake. When we Im have image of this quality, we, we can also do what is called digital image correlation, so correlate an image with the next one. And for example, see as a function of time uh, how the sample will start to be broken. So it's activated here. You see there is this little green zone. And from this green zone, the fracture will propagate. So I showed you previously a movie of a small sample with micro fracture where we're just squeezing rocks. So one experiment like that, it takes uh, two or three days to prepare and uh, 12 hours to run. This experiment, it takes one hour to prepare and three microseconds to run. It's just a shot, so very fast. We try to compare also different rocks. So that's the granite, that's the equivalent of the continental crust. And here the rock is shattering and we use also a porous rock and perhaps you see that in this case, the rock doesn't shatter. It's still deformed, but it starts to create this, uh, what we call a shear zone. So these zones here that correspond to some lateral displacement during deformation. In this kind of experiment also, we can recover the sample. So if we put the sample in a little jacket, we avoid it explode. We can recover it and imagine it's really. And in 3D, what we see that the sample has been shattered. It contains numerous fractures. So there is what we call a granulation process, a transformation of a pure solid into a granular material by the shock wave of the earthquake. And that's what happens for the, the granite. And for porous rock, we get more of this kind of uh, what we call these shear zones that correspond to some uh, faulting and some slip during uh, in the sample. 
So what I would like to test in this uh, big project is uh, to change a bit the concept on how we understand earthquake. Instead of having an earthquake, which is just a slip on an interface, to start to think of what could prepare the earthquake and how the volume around the interface could control the earthquake preparation process. So starting for this image from California, where there is a lot of small earthquakes at some distance from the main faults, we see the same in the Marmara Sea. So Istanbul is just there. That's the North Anatolian fault in the Marmara Sea. And there is some activity on the fault, but there are many earthquakes also outside of the fault. And how all this seismicity far from the fault will control the main earthquake, uh, I think it's an open question. And that's one of the motivations of the, of the Earth. So how we have been evolving in the past 50 years? We have been evolving from a few seismometers and geologic, geologists going on the field to all these fleets of instruments who study earthquake and synchrotrons now are part of this instrument in the same way that the seismometers, uh, satellites, or GPS. And I thank you for this very attention.